Thank you for downloading Wireless Nights from BBC Radio 4. Yeah, walking down the aisle looking for my seat. I've got my boarding pass. Seat 26F, I think. This, yeah, excuse me. Yeah, I've got the window seat, yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, good evening. This is, is the captain. Welcome aboard. Mm, thank you. Uh, we're taxiing out at the moment to uh, runway 25 right. Yeah, it's one of my favourite runways, actually, that way. Yeah, it's nice. Very well illuminated. And very smooth. Extremely smooth. Las Vegas. Gorgeous view. Lovely. City that tried to banish night with its countless miles of neon tubing. In fact, the routing tonight is, is quite a southerly one. Yeah, make yourself comfortable. Yeah, the seat goes all the way back. This is first class, you know. Nibbles will be along in a minute. Which takes us really just to the south. Welcome to Wireless Nights. Or should I say, Wireless Flights. You and I are going to take an overnight transatlantic flight together. Oh, yes, we are. And rather than surf the in-flight movie channels, I thought we could eavesdrop on some of the real-life human drama back down on the earth below. The life and death situations taking place right now as the world rotates slowly beneath us. At the moment, our patients are fairly stable. They're sick. But they're Please pay attention to the safety procedure. Visit with this each there on this place. Drive from it all the snares of the enemy. By the holy angels dwell with us. This patient's rhythm is not regular. The this gentleman here has got a, a CPAP machine, which is just a respiratory tubing into his neck. Without this machine, this gentleman wouldn't be here with us. The initial cruising height. Uh, Preserve us, O oh Lord, while waking, and guard us while sleeping, that awake we may watch with you, and asleep we may rest in The forecast us. weather for us on route this evening is, uh, generally speaking, quite nice. We We've reached our cruising altitude. The cabin lights have been extinguished. The in-flight entertainment system has been enabled. You can let your seat back and relax. Bon voyage. These seats are comfortable, aren't they? Why did I come to sheep? Well... The Lord is my shepherd, I'll not want. He maketh me down to lie. I was eight years away in the Navy. Worked on aircraft. Fleet air arm, I was, you see. If I hadn't have married and had children, I would have stayed the full time in the Navy. I came home from the Navy on the Saturday and on Sunday I went to the pictures with the wife. On the way home on the bus, I met somebody who I'd been to school with. Well, he said, I'll tell you what, Bill, he said, I want a shepherd bad. Sheep farmers used to, and some of them still do, count their sheep in a curious fashion. Yan, Chan, Tether, Mother, Pip, Azar, Cesar, Aka, Conta, Dick. I said, well, you know, I'm, you know, I've been in the Navy eight years, I can't be a shepherd not just like that. He said, oh, you'll learn. Bill has now been a shepherd for 60 years. Tilly, on the other hand, is still training. You know that we're supposed to share this armrest. This is my first year being employed overnight. Um, but it's a bit scary. I did my first night on Thursday. That you're in charge, that you've got to get everything done up to a certain standard. Tilly will be up all night. You can't tell a sheep that it's only allowed to give birth in daylight. <laughs> Not a right long time ago, there was a shepherdess on a moor in Swaledale. Well, a shepherd. I've got two heads right here. But this is proving to be a difficult birth. She's trying to push two out all at once, and me and Tilly have had this before, and they've come out, they have come out dead. Looks like it's going to be a long night. Yeah, I did get that. Oh, Molly Are you playing Tetris? Come on, please stay with me. Pay attention. Up up on swell then steep on bleak yard. Chant to the mother pip, she said. Grow little sheep, come hell, come snow yard. Chant to the mother pip, she counted. I still look after them just the same as I did when I first started. In fact, better. You see, I'm one of them people that just, just love my job. 
you know, I do, I, I exactly love my job. I haven't got a boyfriend. I don't generally care. I prefer to be in the lamb and shed. Fine warm wool for a gentleman's shoulder blades. Young John to the mother pip, she said. Tea and coffee will be served shortly. Cruising height uh, is 35,000 feet tonight, and as we burn off fuel and get lighter, then we'll climb up later on. Do you usually talk to people on flights? Ask people about their jobs and stuff like that, what their ambitions are. Lots of kids at my school wanted to be airline pilots. I wanted to go one step further and be an astronaut. As a teenager, I used to, on the weekends, catch the bus and stand there either on the top of the car parks or on the perimeter road at Heathrow with my packet of sandwiches and my airband radio and my flask of tea and I would watch the aeroplanes and particularly the 747. As a, as a young teenager I was watching the 747s coming into land and that's me, that's, that's me now. I do sometimes tend to get just a little bit of choppy skies as we cross. I don't know about you but I find it hard to switch off on a plane. I think everybody's a little bit nervous of flying. As I sit there in, in the dark, keeping an eye on my instruments and how the flight is progressing, I feel quite protective, I suppose, towards the folks in the back, and uh, there's a sense of guardianship. Turbulence. You kind of look to the other passengers and see what they're doing. So, you know, the plane starts shaking around. I'm looking at the guy next to me. He doesn't seem to be too bothered. He's still reading his golfing magazine. So, yeah, this is normal. Seems to be shaking quite a lot, though. You know, it seems to be, you know, one of the uh, doors on the overhead lockers just came open. But the stewardess comes and closes it. Still, you know, people are playing Tetris. Can't be that bad. If you see a stewardess walking quite quickly, you think, well, she's trying to keep it together, but but maybe there is a situation now. Uh, but certainly nothing to get too concerned about. Um, and uh, we'll update you, of course, uh, on the weather for Gatwick. My main man on a plane is Hugh Grant. He's talked about this thing of crying on aeroplanes, on how you, your emotions seem a bit raw um, when you're on a long flight. And you can get into these strange emotional terrains and states. So it's strange that he should talk about that, because for me, he's the master of the in-flight movie. There's something comforting about Hugh's presence and you need that on a plane, you need something that makes you think that everything's all right. It's like the further away you are physically from all that human drama unfolding below you, the more it affects you. Could you come with me? Um, We're now in the Royal London Hospital in Whitechapel. Family, so we'll just be very careful. Meet Helen. She's a transplant coordinator. That means if a patient dies, she has to deal with organ donation issues. I'll be honest with you, it's not an easy job. Very demanding, very challenging. Does a family say yes? Part of my job role is to organise theatres, to find the timing slot for theatres. They often go into the emergency theatre. Hello Maggie, it's Helen speaking. And it can often go into the very early hours. Hello Maggie, did you get my email? Huge amount of organisation. Lovely. Yes please. That's right. So we have a potential tomorrow. It's very still now, isn't it? Most of the other passengers are asleep. Wanted to be fresh for those important meetings tomorrow, I suppose. But I can't sleep. I never have been able to. It's like there's a low-grade background hum of dread that I just can't ignore. The difficult birth continues as the night draws on. Are you right, Phil? Do you want to ring Matt again? I hate, I hate losing them every time. But this one's not lost yet. <laughs> Do you want to ring Matt? The wife used to, you know, I used to bring these half-dead ones round and she used to perform her miracles down here with them. 
we had them in little boxes, cardboard boxes down here, you know, by the Rayburn, yeah, to get them warm. You see? Over the heather when the weather is cold, yarn, chant to the mother pip she counted. Some of them survive and some of them don't. It's a bit of a heartbreak, but you, you get hard over the years, you know, and just take it in your, in your stride. Good old little sheep, come death, come dark yarn, chant to the mother pip she counted. I've been nursing now since um, 1984. I remember that first person I laid out 28 years ago, a little old lady, a little old Irish lady, and she died. And I had to help the other nurses. I was a student nurse. I remember her face to this day. It was tragic because she was on her own. I remember feeding her um, porridge the, the previous day and she wanted salt on it. No milk or sugar, but she wanted salt. And I found that really unusual because I never had to give anyone salt on their porridge. Apparently it's very usual. Little Irish lady, very, very thin. But she was alone and she died. And it wasn't expected. And um, I still remember that poor lady to this day. After that, everything just... It was a job that I had to do and I tried to do it as well as I could. All the things I carry with me... Our route this evening is a little bit south of where we might normally expect to go. Uh, the reason for that is that we're taking advantage of a very strong wind. Some people don't enjoy plane travel because there's no sense of actually travelling. It's more like being in a lift for a very long time. You're in one place, the door closes, and when it opens again, you're in another. Every time I use a key... I'm reminded that I live in a fallen world. I just wish I lived in one where there were no locks or keys, let alone alarms. And a new character emerges from the darkness, the vicar of St Edward's, Cambridge. We've done that right. I'm going to switch on um, various of the lights in the church. Compline, at Girton College, Cambridge. Another way to deal with the darkness, maybe? It was the very last office or sequence of prayer in the monastic days. It was, it was good night prayers for monks. And it was a kind of liminal service between the day and the night, and between going, it's the last thing you said before you went to sleep. And sleep is a surrender, of course, and a forgetting sleep is a little death, a little letting go. And so they gathered together in one place all those wonderful passages in the Psalms and the Scriptures which were about that kind of trusting yourself back to the one from whence you came, says, you know, into thy hands, O Lord, I commend my spirit. Words from the Psalms, but also, of course, words from Jesus on the cross as he breathes himself into God. So gathered together those senses of the fear of the dark and named them and asked for safety and deliverance. You're in one place, the door closes, and when it opens again, you're in another. As well as being one of the priests here and a chaplain at Girton, I have a, a role um, more widely in the diocese as what's called a bishop's advisor on deliverance ministry. And um, that simply means that I'm, together with others, available where uh, a parish priest might find themselves confronted by somebody who really feels from within and is distressed by the thought that they are subject to some form of spiritual or they might even call it demonic oppression. I've once or twice been called late at night to situations where people in a household are terrified and won't go into a room or um, 
yeah, they feel they've seen things or things have happened. And I've gone to the house and wondering what would be the case and seen real fear on the faces of the people I've I've encountered. Now, it takes a certain amount of conscious choice not to become party to that fear. My job is not to be party to this fear. To remember that very, very beautiful saying of Jesus, not quoted often enough, perfect love casts out fear. He uses the actual language of exorcism himself there, <laughs> casts out fear. I mean, I can remember in that particular situation, I didn't um, see any manifestations myself, but I was aware of being in a household full of fear, and I went into every room and um, prayed and, and blessed it and prayed that prayer from Compline, in fact. Visit, we beseech thee, O Lord, this place, and drive from it all the snares of the enemy, and may thy holy angels dwell with us to preserve us in peace. And we did actually, you know, restore calm, and there was a young child in that household as it happened, and that was where the calm needed to start. At some point on the flight, there will be a lull, and in that lull, you're left in your own company, and you will have to face yourself. Maybe that's what frightens people on flights. Am I putting you on a bit of a downer? No, I say, you know, I've had, I've had a good life. This is what I told the doctor when he said to me, bypass, I said, no, can't bypass. So he said, you're refusing the operation? I said, yeah. So he said, why? I said, I'm nearly 85. I said, I've had a good life. I said, I don't know if I want to die today, but I don't mind tomorrow. Abide with me, fast for seven times. That's, that's what I'm going to have at my funeral. I've had a good life. It's breathing. <laughs> that's all right, just leave it there, that's fine. But we've got a foot, feet are out and a bit stuck on the head, see? Last time Tilly tried to deliver two lambs at once, both they and the mother died. And she's starting to feel like she's seen this story before. No, we don't. All right. It's not going to be the same as last time you did. Two reasons why the lamb, sheep, pastor imagery is so strong in Christianity. One is, of course, that Christianity arises out of Judaism and the original, as it were, patriarchs of the Jewish faith were pastoral people. They kept uh, flocks and wandered from one place to another with their flocks. But it had another resonance, a kind of darker, if you like, a slightly bloodier resonance in the kind of sacrificial system of the temple. And particularly, of course, in the formative story of Judaism, which was the Exodus story. And you remember that in that story, um, an avenging angel is coming to slay the firstborn of Egypt. But the sign which will allow the chosen people to be passed over by the avenging angel is the blood of a lamb, that they are to take the blood of a lamb and put it on the lintel of the door. And the sign of the blood will mean that the angel passes over and the family survive. Now, that's a very dark and difficult story, but it is about finding a salvation through the blood of another. I remember a young girl came in, she was only 17. It was a road traffic accident, she was in the car, um, and the driver was drunk. But I always remember this. It had a little tattoo on her, on her wrist, and it was, I always remember looking at it, thinking how lovely it was. It was just a, a young girl who lost her life uh, to something so stupid. And her sister came in, who was a, um, slightly older. She had two sisters. And her sister was very angry. She was angry that her younger sister was in this situation. And she was angry at the nursing staff, angry with the doctors, angry with you know the mother, angry with everything, angry with life because her, her sister was in this situation. And after a while, 
she did her hair. We did her hair together. We washed her hair. We put makeup on her and we took the top section of her hair and wrapped it up and we put it in a little bun like she used to like it. And um, we, I said, bring some nail varnish in. I said, bring some clothes in. Do whatever you want to do. Do whatever makes you feel happy, you know, for this, for your, for your sister. And they did. And the last day, she went for donation. And the last day, I said to her sister... And we do this with some patients. I said, would you like to get on the bed and hold her? And we closed the curtains and she got on the bed and she was holding her. And all I can hear from outside was crying, absolutely crying. And, you know, we had to walk away. There's about three of us and we had to walk away because just thinking about it now makes me think, oh, dear God. You know? And it was very, very sad, very, very sad. But I hope that she would take that with her and know that her last times with her sister were special. That's all you can do. She was young, um, young and fit, and she was able to donate her heart and lungs and her kidneys and her liver. The rest of humanity is living its life on the ground below you as you travel miles above them and they can't telephone you and you can't receive emails so it's becoming one of those few places of kind of isolation we should value that transatlantic meditation anyone great deal of Christian life and faith and probably the deepest, the kind of nine-tenths submerged part of Christian prayer is really about the fruitful and womb-like qualities of our present darkness. And that's why I think it's good to pray at night. It's why I love Compline. Uh, it's why I like silence. Um, I love that saying of John of the Cross as I said, to my soul be still and let the darkness come upon you which shall be the darkness of God the way he says how well I know that fountain filling running although it is the night the flight that sticks in my mind most in my life was a very long flight to Australia that I took Nine months after the birth of my son, just me and him. It felt like I was delivering something very precious and very fragile. But all those intimations of mortality and stuff seemed thrown into sharper focus somehow when travelling with someone who was oblivious to it all. It still is a miracle that you're up in the air. And then it's time for a nappy change. No, no, I wasn't talking about you. I was reminiscing. Uh, at the moment, we have a wind uh, behind us of about 180 miles an hour. Uh, halfway across the Atlantic Ocean. Uh, speed an the almost ground. imperceptible lightening of the eastern horizon. You may There's just, just that beginning of the darkness uh, starting to think about fading away. The dawn starts to come up. The font is the womb of the church. It's that out of which we're born, and it symbolizes the beginning of life. And we move gradually towards the east. This is a ritual reversal of the time of the world, because the world thing is like you rise in the east and you set in the west, and, you know, as the sun does, and we all move towards our declination and darkness of death. Whereas, of course, the spiritual life is in exactly the opposite direction. We start with the death in the baptism pool. Baptism is a ritual drowning and being born again. And then we make our way gradually towards the dawn, towards the east, and every altar is set in the east because it is the rising of the sun. So just to come into a church and walk from the font to the altar is to reverse the arrow of time and to walk out of declination and darkness towards sunrise. And 
And then there's that moment when you see chinks of light coming from beneath the window shades and the stewardesses start walking down the aisles again and you realise, yeah, we're on the home stretch. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, there's a little bit of an update uh, on the progress. And then people start to stir and take off those eye mask things and a queue starts to build up around the bathroom with people clutching their dental kits with those tiny tubes of toothpaste. And then breakfast arrives on a plastic tray with everything in its correct compartment and you're allowed to put the shade up and take in the view. Anastasio means, it means resurrection. <laughs> We're a good lot. And it's alive. <laughs> Pull it out. Make sure the umbilical cord breaks, because that's what makes them breathe. There you have it. Nice, healthy lamb. It's all good. Behold the Lamb of God. I feel it's a privilege bringing something into the world because I don't want kids. So it's my own version of giving birth, really. See, I told you everything would be all right. So ladies and gentlemen, very good morning to you all from the flight deck. This is the captain. I just can't wait uh, to see the, now, these all sheep be mine. To have my own flock. And uh, starting our descent down towards London. Uh, that's it for me. Thank you very much for your attention. Yeah, we made it. A long night's journey into the day. All the way to Gatwick. Uh, we should be landing at about 25 past 10. I hope you had a very pleasant flight. We hope you will fly wireless nights again very soon. My name is Jarvis Cocker. Thank you for your company. And all the best for your onward journey. Wireless Nights was presented by Jarvis Cocker. The producer was Lawrence Grizzell. If you enjoyed it, there are many other podcasts available. Just visit www.bbc.co.uk forward slash radio 4.